Then right there. We've already seen those. Seen those. Okay, main character is Talion. The Grave Walker. Could you really rest for all of eternity knowing that you had the chance to stop him, but did nothing? The time has come for a new ring, Talion. Talion's life is one of perseverance through tragedy. A ranger captain stationed at the Black Gate between Mordor, uh, Gondor and Mordor, Talion battled the servants of Sauron when they attacked the fortress. Talion fought bravely but was captured, then forced to watch his Black Hands of Sauron slew his wife and son. Talion was next to fall to the Black Hand's blade, but instead of dying, he found himself banished from death and bound to an elven wraith, Kelbrimbor. The two inhabited Talion's body, and Talion found himself denied the peace of the afterlife with his family. Seeking revenge against Sauron and the three servants who murdered his family, the Hammer, the Tower, and the Black Hand, Talion and Skelbrimbor fought a grill war against the Orcs of Mordor, avenged Talion's family, and fought Sauron to a standstill. Now, Talion seeks to end Sauron's dominion over Mordor, and save the rest of Gondor from the fate of the doomed soldiers of the Black Gate. To this end, he and Kelbrimbor have fashioned a new ring of power they hope will give them the upper hand. Kelbrimbor, forger of the Rings of Power. I shipped the history of Middle Earth. I crafted the Rings of Power. Kelbrimbor. Last to the house of Faron, uh, Faranor, Kelbrimbor, hand of silver and Saradrin, was the greatest of the elven craftsmen. Responsible for crafting, for crafting the Rings of Power, working with Sauron, Kelbrimbor made 16 great rings for the uh, Sixteen great rings for the men and, the, and for the men and the dwarves. Without uh, Sauron's knowledge, he made three more rings for the elves. It was deceived by Sauron, who crafted one ring to dominate the other rings. Sauron then captured Kelbrimbor and directed him to further perfect the one ring, inscribing with uh, inscribing it with the Tengwar script. Realizing the scope of Sauron's ambition, Kelbrimbor escaped with the one ring. Using the One Ring's power to raise an army of orcs, Kelbrimbor Kel fought Sauron for dominance over Mordor. In a titanic battle against Sauron, Kelbrimbor defeated the Dark Lord, but lost the One Ring when it slipped off his finger, and onto Sauron's, before the killing blow. In revenge, Sauron murdered Kelbrimbor's family before his eyes, then killed Kelbrimbor with his own smithing hammer. But with Kelbrimbor's fate bound to the One Ring, he was doomed to remain a wraith until the One Ring was, is unmade. Kelbrimbor's spirit possessed Talon's body, when the ranger died at the hands of the Black Hand of Sauron. Kelbrimbor had been a wraith so long that he didn't initially remember his name or past, but with Talon's help, he has regained his memories, including the memory of how to forge a new ring of power. Few in Mordor know Kelbrimbor by name, but many know him as the Bright Lord, a union of Talon and Kelbrimbor. The present-day orcs who flock to the Bright Lord's fortresses don't realize that the Bright Lords they've heard about in folk tales is the same historical figure, Kelbrimbor himself, who took the Bright Lord moniker centuries ago when he first strove against Sauron. Lutario, the Blade of Gadriel. I strike down men corrupted by these rings. Lutario was selected by the Elven Queen uh, by the elven queen Gladriel to go to Mordor to strike the Nazgul. She initially took to the task with relish, but over time she's begun to doubt whether hunting unkillable enemies accomplishes anything. A patient hunter, she re relies on stealth and almost preternatural stillness, then strikes without warning, hoping to end the battle before it begins. If necessary, Lotario will strike out, stake out a location for days, waiting for one of Nazgul to arrive. Lotario doesn't triumph in every confrontation with Nazgul, but even when victory loses her, she's, al she's always survived to hunt another day. Her many successes against them, for her many successes against them, however, are short-lived, as the fallen Nazgul can, can, uh, can reconstitute itself using the Ring of Power it wears. She, she, while she may wonder about her ultimate purpose, Lothario takes grim satisfaction in knowing that even the Nazgul aren't entirely safe in, in Mordor, and, and hopes that her efforts to keep the Nine confined and, and hopes that her efforts keep the Nine confined to the Land of Shadow. Shilip, the last child. Weaver fate, a child of Ungunt, let us master this unhappy world. I serve none but myself. Shulub's presence in Mordor predates that of Sauron. She is the last child of an ancient evil named Ungaunt. Un Ungunt? A man of Middle Earth's aligned spiders, including, that of including those of Mirkwood, are Shulub's descendants. To most, she is known by the form of a giant spider, which inspires fear in orcs and men alike. When Talion and Kelbrimbor forge the new ring, she snatches Kelbrimbor away and exchanges him for the ring. The visions of the future she grants Talion guide his path through the siege of Minas Tirith and beyond. 
An uneasy alliance begins between the three, though as Caliber and Boris want to remind Halion, or Shiro might be the enemy Sauron. It's unclear whether she is their ally. Karnan, nature's guardian. Spirit of Karnan is tree and beast, fang and claw, root and spear. The town the spirit of Cal the spirit of Karnan is the spirit of Karnan is a prim primeval force of nature that has existed in Force Mordor since before all reckoning. Little is known of her history, and few dare enter what remains of her forest. To the Orcs of Mordor, the Farce of Canon is a place of terror from which few return. Likewise, Ka Ka Kanon has little interest, limited in interest in the affairs of men and orcs, though she does not abide the ravenous nature of orc industry, particularly their rapidious logging efforts. She was roused. To I, I'm not. I'm not used to that word. She was roused to action in the Second Age when the Balrog known as Targaroth arose to menace the surface world. A creature of devastating power, Targarot, was responsible for the destruction of much of Karnan's ancient forest, and the creatures who, who lived within it. This set the stage for a battle that only ended with Targarot buried deep in, deep in the pits of Gorgoroth. Like, like the Entwives, Karnan uh, uh, is, is a protector of life rather than a bringer of death, though that distinction would likely be lost on her. As Mercurial as nature itself, she can be destructive and can be destructive and serene, playful and deadly serious. Karnan's mor uh, mortality is bound to the great tree of forest, the only place where she's able to take human form. She extends her reach in Mordor, um, and adapts to her nemesis by assuming the form of Caragors, Graugs, and Drakes. Most of the time, however, she's but a voice in the wind. Ratbag. Survivor, coward, boat. Don't get me wrong, I almost respect Ratbag. Who else has gone so far with so little? Ratbag is either Mordor's greatest survivor, or merely the, its luckiest orc. Scrawny by orc standards, Ratbag has managed to survive, and indeed thrive despite mediocre combat skills, his startling stupidity, tendency towards self-delusion, grandiosity, and a general demeanor that makes most orcs want to kill him. Bound and left for dead by other orcs, orcs, Ratbag convinced Talion to free him in exchange for information on how to lure high-ranking warchiefs into the open. Over time, they developed an uneasy partnership, with Ratbag ascending the orc ranks as Talion's cat's paw. Ta uh, Ratbag eventually became a warchief with Talion's help, but his rulership was cut short when the Hammer, a servant of Sauron, apparently killed him with a single blow. Ratbag survived, but was later captured by a gang of orcs along with an Ulog. Through the form, he managed to escape, rescuing the Ulog, whom he named Ranger in honor of Talion. Since the events of Middle Earth, Shadow of Mordor, uh, Ratbag and Ranger climbed the ranks of the Orc army, eventually rising to rule fortress uh, as a mythical two-headed overlord known as the Etten. Bruise, a real battler. It's time to separate your weak from their heads. Bruise's love of fighting is matched only by his knack for it, and even among Mordor's Ulgs, uh, Bruise's name uh, lacks fear and respect. He's a force to be reckoned with on the battlefield and a tremendous, a tremendous asset in a siege, and enemies and allies alike know to keep their distance, distance when he's on a rampage. His favorite kind of combat is a deadly contest that takes place in Mordor's fight pits. It is rumored that Bruce has never lost a fight. Rumor Bruce does everything in his power to fuel, including tearing the head off anyone who claims to know what it was. Bruce has made a great number of enemies in his time in Mordor, not so much van vanquished opponents. Uh, who rarely survived the encounter with him, but captains and war chiefs who have seen their ranks depleted by Bruce's victories. For the many debts, uh, death threats placed on him by these enemies, Bruce's, Bruce dismisses them as just good for a giggle. Whether Bruce decided to betray Talion over time or, always ha uh, or had al always intended this will never be known, but ultimately he saw an opportunity and couldn't resist taking it. While Bruce's plot failed, he was able to escape and remain a torn on Talion's side. Bruises' treachery cost him dearly when Talion dominated and deranged him, leaving him a shell of his fearsome former self, and warning to others who might contemplate crossing the Bright Lord. Gollum, Seeker of the One Ring My heart tells me that Gollum has some part to play, uh, play, to play yet, for good or ill, before this is over. The One Ring dominates Gollum's every thought, even though the ring is, re uh, is resting in, in Bilbo's pocket in the Shire, leagues away from Mordor. He wanders Mordor in pursuit of Baggins in the One Ring, staying one step ahead of the orcs who dismiss him as a teething pest. Gollum's lust for the One Ring draws him to the Bright, War the Bright Master, Celebrimbor, and by extension Talion. 
exploiting Gollum's worshipful reverence of for her. She abuses Gollum as a spy and a lure for the nearby orcs she feeds on. When she needs to draw time to her, Gollum makes an effect, effective guise. Gollum is in wi strong, wise, or brave in the conventional sense, but he possesses quick reflexes and a superior instinct for survival. He survived thus far through preternatural trickery and a self-serving cowardice, and fate has left a part for uh, has, has left a part for him to play. Ah, and you can zoom in on it. There's still someone else to turn up in the main characters. Idril. The stories of the past shape us. They damn us. They hold us. F uh, hope for an ideal for us to live up to. Most uh, most of us fail, but we strive, and that's what matters. Second Captain Idril. Second Captain Id Idril is a shield maiden, the only child of Minas Ital's military leader, General Castamir. She's a trained soldier, defending against the Witch King's siege, and is eager to prove herself in battle. Idril is strong-willed, proud, and very conscious of coming from a military family that has served uh, Min Minas Ital for generations. She has trained all her life, but the siege of Minas Ital is her first true experience of war. She considers herself a custodian of the city and its foremost historian. Idril's mother died during an orc raid when, uh, when Idril was only 11, so Idril has mostly had to raise herself. This has made herself sufficient and relentless in the pursuit of her goals. As an adolescent, her goal was to avenge her mother. She repeatedly slipped into Serret Ungol to attack orc encampments. After growing wary of Gondorian patrols returning his daughter's safety, Castamir enrolled Idril in the military, so she would have a fighting chance when she inevitably sought orcs to slay. Weary. Uh, before the siege of Minas Ithil, she spent much of her free time cataloging the vast collection of artifacts in Minas Ithil's Great Hall. She is familiar with its treasures, though the workings of some, like the plant here, remain mysterious to her. With the fall of Minas Ithil, uh, Idril engages in a lonesome struggle on two fronts, continue her war against the orcs who her mother, and to recover the treasures of the Great Hall. Castamere. Minas Ithil stands not because of its walls, but because of its people. We sit at the edge of a very dark sea, and we hold back the tide. Drunel Castamere is the leader of Minas Ithil's military forces, proud son of Gondor and a decorated war hero. Many see him as the only thing keeping Sauron's overwhelming siege forces at bay. He is a well-respected but demanding leader, with a practical hard -nose and hard-nosed perspective that enables him to find unconventional solutions and take calculated risks to achieve his goals. Castamere came from a military family, following in the footsteps of his father and grandfather. He has a hardened exterior that doesn't falter, but an affectionate relationship with his daughter, Idril, whom he loves above all else. While he appears humorous, a closer look reveals an intelligent man who is deeply preoccupied with the fate of a city and is beginning to show the strains of it. Gasmir is smart enough to know a hopeful situation when he sees it, impractical enough to wrest what advantages he can from the enemy. When the orc siege, as the orc siege lengthened, the strain took its toll. Willing to make any sacrifice for his daughter's safety, Gasmir struck a bargain with the Witch King. It drew safety in exchange for the city and the Plantier within it. Upon obtaining Plantier, the Witch King killed Casimir, turned Minas Ithil into Minas Un Morgul, scattering the few human survivors. Even death was not the end of Casimir's fall. He found himself raised as a white by the Nazgul Is Isildur to challenge Talion once more. Baranor. Uh, Minas Ithil is the only home I've ever really known, the only family I've ever really known, and I will fight to defend it. Captain Baranor is second in command to General Castamere, born to a Herodrim family near Umbar. He was exchanged with a Gondorian child as a guarantee of peace. In the intervening years, contact was lost with his people, and was raised as a Gondorian by a wealthy family in Minas Ithil. A trusted lieutenant, he was recognized early on by Castamere for his bravery and superior combat abilities. He rose through ranks quickly to become Castamere's bodyguard, and ultimately his second in command. Baranor has devoted his life to the service of his adopted city. It is the only home he's ever known. He is well, brave, grounded by a strong moral compass, and willing to give his life for his general. Captain Baronor rarely lets down his guard and lives by a strict military code. Dagger. I never wanted to be a leader, but killing orcs comes na naturally to me. So here we are. Those who knew Dagger as a child described him as a bit off, and someone who didn't always play well with other children. Dagger never threw off this re reputation as he matured, but developed an undeniable talent. He's a natural when it comes to killing. He discovered his talent as an adolescent when a uh, trio of bandits mistook him for an easy target. He soon joined the ranks of Gondor's finest and quickly established a reputation as a loner and a, as a killer. Dagor's superiors repeatedly pushed to promote him, but he declined. He insisted that he was a fighter, not a leader. He only relented when they, they told him he'd be given his, chance, uh, his choice of missions if he led his own men. 
Today's unit draws in those who want to only one thing, a chance to kill. Well, it sounds like he's, like, a, you know, the kid that, like, tortures mice, you know, a sociopath. Or a psychopath, you know. Um... <laughs> he ends up finding a productive way to channel such urges. Productive way indeed. It, uh, Taran Tarandor? If the fate of Middle Earth will be decided minus Ithil, then that is my post. Tarandor comes from a military family with a long history of service to Gondor. His forebears all served in the garrison of Minas Ithil, training for war, but knowing, thanks to long dormancy of Sauron, only peace. Throughout their service, these men, more of noble to service, face no greater enemies than boredom and routine. For the first few years of his service, Tarandor's situation was the same, and at times he yearned for ba battle, to be tested, to be real service to his kingdom and its people. With this yawning always came a pang of guilt, that he should be dissatisfied with the peace that had been so hard won. All this fell away when siege banners came over the horizon. Since then, the only days Tarandor is not on the wall are those when he's raiding behind enemy lines. Heron. Harian, you trogs walk around Mordor like you own your place. Well, you don't, and you never will. Harian has a distinction of being the only soldier in the to achieve rank of sergeant three times because he's been demoted twice. Uh, demoted twice. As a recruit, Harian made a name for himself with an aggressive, can do attitude, but his superiors found his demeanor abrasive. As demoted, now he cashiered for striking his superior officer. When he, he rose through the ranks a second time, and he found his rank. To, uh, Reduced for dereliction of duty after an off-duty celebration grew out of control. Now it's his third ascent through the army ranks, and Harrion is doing everything he can to keep his temper under control. Even so, Bar Baronor must repeatedly remind him to save it for the orcs. Yorith and Dar Dirhal. Uh. <laughs> damn. <laughs> Checking out the dead chick. Uh. Italian family. On on winds and waters may you cross, see mountains white and blue, but on your road let's never forget the, the love I have for you, your song. Your Italian in Minas Tirith, when he was a young soldier, then joined him in near exile after Talion slew a nobleman who attacked her. Following Talion to his new posting among the rangers at the Black Gate, Yorit gave birth to their, their son, Deerhow, there. The family grew up amid the military encampment, accustomed to Spartan conditions and life on the frontier. Then Sauron's orcs attacked the Black Gate, and despite Talion's efforts to keep his wife and son safe, the Black Hand of Sauron captured Old Tree. Talion was forced to watch as the Black Hand murdered Yorit and Deerhow. The Black Hand then slit Talion's throat as well, but Kalbrimbor's spirit found a home in Talion's fallen form. The duo rose from dead and eventually killed the Black Hand, avenging Talion's wife and child. Gladriel, Lady of Lauren. In the place of a dark lord, you would have a queen, not dark, but beautiful, and terrible as the morn. Treacherous as the sea, stronger than the foundations of the earth, all shall love me and despair. Though she dwells beyond Mordor and Lothlorien, Lothlorien, Gladriel is keenly interested in events relating to the One Ring. She wears a ring of power that Calibrimbor gave her, though it's one of the elven rings, so Sauron has no direct d d domination over, dominion over it. And as an elf queen, she's long lived enough to be considered ancient when Calibrimbor forged her rings in the first place. Gladriel's history among the elves stretches back to the First Age. Gladriel's history among the elves stretches back to the First Age, but in the present day, she is more troubled by Sauron. Uh, stirring in Mordor than her peers, and she was more willing to take action. She dispatched Letario, one of the elves' most accomplished warriors, to hunt the Nazgul in Mordor, thus keep Sauron occupied and off balance. Gladriel knows that Letario cannot permanently kill the Nazgul, but Gladriel hopes that she can frustrate and delay the Dark Lord's rise. Gladriel uh, was able to drive Sauron out of Dol Gladur, but within Mordor, his power grows ever stronger. Saruman, the White Wizard. For a moment, whatever way I saw his face, I kept seeing Willem Dafoe. I think it's something about the eyes. I must see the head of my order. He is both wise and powerful. Trust me, Frodo, he'll know what to do. When the five wizards, when the five wizards sent to Middle-earth to challenge Sauron, uh, Sar Saruman, 
Saruman desires the power of the One Ring for himself, though he's not yet under Sauron's control. He spies upon Mordor from his tower in Is Isengard, and is keen for any information about the affairs there. After Sauron's defeat in Isod Isildur's death at the River Anduin, Saruman's forces searched in vain for both Isildur's body and the One Ring that he carried. Though nominally a member of the White Council along with Gandalf, Saruman has decided to study the arts of the enemy for himself, and he hopes that Saruman's return will result in the re-emergence of the One Ring, which Saruman can claim for himself. He is aware of Calibrimbor and the new ring as well, hoping that a struggle between Calibrimbor and Sauron will at the very least weaken both parties. Sauron, Dark Lord of Mordor Sauron has armies. He is the Nazgul, but his true power is knowing the weaknesses of his enemies. Originally an immortal spirit called the Maiar, uh, Maiar, My Maiar, Maiar, Maiar. Uh. Sauron is older than Middle Earth itself. From the beginning of time, Sauron wished to bring order to the world. He would do, uh, he would, would do through the power of his craft and his alliances. He joined the first Dark Lord Morgoth until a war with the Elves and cast Morgoth out beyond the world. Sauron escaped and hid in Middle-earth, but he survived and had learned from his master. He would do what Morgoth could not. Sauron formed the alliance with, with the elven jewel smith, Celebrimbor, and together they created the Rings of Power. In secret, however, Sauron created the One Ring to dominate all the others. Sauron poured much of himself into the One Ring, which made him more powerful, but also more vulnerable. Uh, I guess the One Ring was a good focus. Well, to a point. After One Ring was lost, Sauron's ability to take physical form became limited. He has returned to Mordor and rules his armies from the shadows of Barad Dur. If he's not stopped, he will assume physical form once more, and his armies will no long will not be contained within Mordor any longer. Sauron fair form, the stranger bearing gifts. That is Sauron's way. He spills poison into the ears of those who listen. He is the Lord of Gifts, the master of treachery. Kill Brimbor. While Sauron was hiding in Middle Earth after Morgoth's defeat, he took on the form of the handsome Lord of Gifts. In disguise, he taught magic techni magical techniques to the elven artisans of, of Aragon, including Kyle Brimbor, with whom he formed an alliance. They shared a common purpose and believed that together they would bring order to Middle Earth and restore a world abandoned by the gods. For her part, Gladriel distrusted his visitor, but Kyle Brimbor had found a kindred spirit. Together, they found the rings. Of, uh, they forged the rings of power, but Sauron secretly made a ring to control the others. The One Ring. When Sauron donned the One Ring, the elves discovered a scheme. Sauron abandoned his guise and went to war with the elves. Despite periodic sec set, um, uh, setbacks, not sexbacks, Sauron's power increased until Isildur cut the One Ring from Sauron's hand, destroying his body and dissipating his spirit. The Nazgul, nine mortal men doomed to die. The Shriekers will skin you as quick as look at you. I, I don't fear much, but I feel, fear the Nazgul. Argul the Knower. Crafted by Sauron and Celebrimbor, the Rings of Power were given to nine men who become the Nazgul, or Ring Wraiths. These men were kings, sorcerers, and warriors, the greatest of their kind, but each was desirous of power, vengeance, or the immortality granted by the Rings. Uh, immortality. In time, the Rings corrupted them, and they either died or fell under Sauron's power. Some rings were lost or passed down through multiple owners, for those who fell under Sauron's control, their human vi visages were lost and they became his most terrible servants. The Nazgul fought at Sauron's side throughout the battles of the Second Age, and they were at his side in the Third Age, when his power grew in the East and he went to war against the kingdoms of men. They have been a constant and sinister presence in Mordor ever since, their expansion only curbed by the elven hunters such as the Blade of Gladriel. The Nazgul are bound to the Rings of Power as Talion is bound to the right, and they cannot be truly destroyed so long as the Rings survive. When defeated in battle, the Nazgul are banished to the fastness of Barad-dûr, or Minas Mogul, from where they slowly regain their physical forms. Many of the Nazgul are the original men doomed by the Rings they donned during the Second Age, but others are more mysterious, and it is unclear how or from where they acquired their rings. Like the others, though, they too fell under Sauron's control. Which King of Ang... Uh, Ang uh, Angmar, first among the nine. Hinder me, thou fool. No wavy man may hinder me. The Witch King of Angmar. Sauron's chief lieutenant, the Witch King of Angmar, is the most powerful of the nine, ra er, nine ring rates. For more than 4,000 years, he has served Sauron's most, tr uh, Sauron's most trusted servant, bound to him by the Ring of Power, except accepted during the Second Age. 
the Witch King has a particular, particular hatred for Gondor, having warred against it centuries ago. After seizing the northern kingdom of Agmar, the Witch King's armies moved slowly cro uh, moved across Middle Earth's northern re um, the Witch King's armies moved across Middle Earth's nor northern regions. An alliance of Gondorian soldiers and elves routed them, though the Witch King himself escaped. The Gondorian prince, Erinor, wanted to chase the Witch King, but the elf Gorfindel bade him stay. Since then, he aspired to become the ruler of Minas Ithil. Chastened by the defeat, the Witch King employed a different strategy, one that, he ex one that exploited Gondorian pride. Remerged years later, when Erinor had become Gondor's king and challenged him to single combat. Erinor accepted, and rode eastward alone, never to be seen again. The Witch King has been unchallenged in combat, and Gondor has been without a king ever since. If Celebrimbor is said to be the nemesis of Sauron, then Talon is certainly the nemesis of the Witch King. It's not enough to see Talon destroy the other men, and so the Witch King pursued uh, him with an obsession bordering on mania. It would not kill Talon, it would make him one of the nine. Saradan, general of about bygone age. The Witch King has taken possession of this city. Now he'll take possession of you, Suladan. One of the nine mortal men doomed to die, Suladan was a great general of the Second Age, whose name means Man of Spirit in Cyrodiil. Sindarin. Sindarin. Suladan led a vast... Uh, Suladan led a vast army that successfully besieged Sudan led a vast army to successfully besiege Sauron's forces, the fortress, though his victory was short-lived short -lived when Sauron unexpectedly surrendered and offered Sudan a ring of power. Sudan accepted the ring, and with this decision, he sealed his fate. Sauron was taken back in chains, but went on to become Sudan's most trusted advisor. Sudan's power grew enormously. During these years, the ring and Sauron exerted their influence over Sudan, making him isolated and weak. Benji fell completely under Sauron's control and became one of the Nazgul. As a Nazgul, Sodan was instrumental in many of Sauron's military campaigns, including the last alliance of men and elves, where he witnessed Sauron's defeat at the hands of Isildur. Like Sauron himself, Sodan was dissipated, though not destroyed, after this defeat. Remerged years later in Gol De Gol Dol Gadur, Sauron's, uh, Sauron's fortress in Mirkwood. Oh, and here's this guy. Uh, Fortog. We've not seen this guy appear. Uh, oh, oh, um, there was like a temporary DLC where you could get him. I haven't seen it on the wiki, so maybe that's why I, like, I was think, oh, I can't see him. I haven't seen it. Maybe you just can't get it anymore, or maybe it's just built in now. I'm not sure. A legend among the orcs of Mordor, Forthog Orc Slayer is an unstoppable warrior who steps from the shadows to save Mordor's mightiest heroes at their moment of greatest need. Mike Forthog Fo uh, Fo Fogi, Forgy, Forgy, was our executive producer and a great friend here at Monolith. We lost Mike to cancer during the development of Shadow of War, and we want to remember and honor him with a little bit of immortality in Mordor. The legendary Forthog Orc Slayer is our way to remember Mike as he lived, he was ready to leap into the fray and save the game. game when, uh, whenever and wherever he was uh, most needed. Helm Hammerhand. I've read him. Isildur, High King of Gondor. It was in this moment, when all hope had faded, that Isildur, son of the king, took up his father's sword. Sauron, the enemy of the free peoples of Middle-earth, was defeated. The ring, the ring passed to Isildur, who had this one chance to destroy evil forever. But the hearts of men are easily corrupted, and the, one, uh, and the ring of power has a will of its own. It, be it betrayed Isildur to his death. Isildur did what no, n no one had thought possible, defeat Sauron at the height of his power. But this great triumph let, led Isildur to become perhaps the One Ring's greatest victim. A founding king of Gondor, Isildur was, one, was among the host that battled Mordor's armies in the last alliance of elves and men. True, uh, though Sauron slew Isildur's father, Elendir, Isildur cut the One Ring from Sauron's hand, defeating the Dark Lord and winning the day for men and elves. Isildur chose to keep the One Ring. He resisted wearing it for some time, though, like so many others, he finally succumbed and placed the ring on his finger. He saw himself as the new Lord of the Rings, but quickly learned that the ring has only one master, and he does not share power. 
The ring, the, the Eye of Sauron, fell upon Isildur, and it was pursued relentlessly by the Dark Lord's forces. Orcs ambushed the king's travelling parties across the Anduin River, and in the ensuing ca- ca- chase, Isildur was killed. The ring flew from his finger and was lost in the, lost in the Anduin, only found years later by the creature now known as Gaal. Isildur's body was retrieved and taken back to Barad Dur. While Sauron had not yet returned to physical form, existing in a spec- spectral half-life, he placed the ring of power on Isildur's finger. This returned him to life, but enslaved him and made him one of the nine. Ranger, Rathbag's protector, uh, Dorbag Gazar, Mazin Domnag, Brightward, what kind of creature are you? Ranger is Rathbag's nickname for an Oog actually named Az Harto. Uh, quite possibly one of the largest and fiercest of Mordor's Oog High, Ranger was fiercely feared and respected for Osti and a keen strategic mind. His months of imprisonment and torture at the hands of a rival Orca gang changed all that. Resigned to death, he became companions with Ratbag, who managed to free them both. Honor bound to Ratbag for his freedom, the two became companions, and Ranger aided him in his rise through the Orc hierarchy. Despite Ratbag's ob- many obvious faults, Ranger found Ratbag's canny survival instinct worked well, in, uh, worked well for the two of them, even if Ratbag didn't know a word of black speech. He helped Ratbag seize one of Mordor's fortresses, then agreed to one of Ratbag's more outlandish schemes. They would create a mythic persona to inspire fear in their enemies, a two-headed troll known as the Etten, where it travelled fast to the fortress's unusual leader, the mystique of their ruse helped cement their authority in Mordor. Targorot, fear and darkness, fear, darkness and shadow, my winds are still, you have awoken Targorot, cracked and creviced until now. Karnan Shroud, uh, shrouded in fire and shadow, Balrogs like Targaroth have existed since the first age of Mordor. Corrupted by Maiar from when the world was young, Balrogs rarely venture from subterranean pits to call home. Though the dwarves and goblins who uh, excavate too deeply may arouse their ire. Uh, Targaroth was a general in the wars of the first age, when the evil Margot battled the Valar. Since then, he has slumbered, awaiting a final battle to settle Middle Earth's fate. With destructive power of a dragon and a seeding anger from thousands of years in the dark, Thargrod is capable of rampaging across the world if given a chance. Against his entire, uh, against his might, entire armies have perished, and even the greatest heroes can fall before him. Zog, ambitious necromancer, look around you, the orcs who, t- the orcs who took this city. This is our army, not Sauron's, not the Witch King's. The dominion of those slave masters is at an end for today. We rise. Zog began as a well servant of Sauron with an ambitious plan. He would go to Gorgoroth and do what no necromancer had done. He would raise a Balrog, the infamous Targaroth, for the greater glory of the Dark Lord's army. Though his effort, effort ended in failure, Zog was undeterred and his ambitions only increased. Why settle for being the greatest necromancer in Mordor, when he could be the new Dark Lord? Supported by a vast network of acolytes, Zog's reach extended throughout Mordor. With them, he could raise an army of undead. With them, he could rule Mordor and lay claim to the world of men. For Zog, true power does not come from the living, but from the dead. A trickster, a megaloman- megalomaniac, Zog inspired rapt devotion from his acolytes and blind allegiance from his reverend followers. Revenant followers. Ever cautious, Zog leaves many dangerous ritual duties to his acolytes, and he will always retreat to fight another day. Only when cornered will he fight to the dead. Though, as he's fond of reminding Talion, a necromancer never truly dies. Danger beyond death. The way is shut. It was made by those who were dead, and the dead keep it. The way is shut. Now you must die, the king of the dead. Revenants, undead orcs and whites, undead men, are rare mortal, but the power of Sauron and that of talented necromancers such as Zog is sufficient to make the dead walk again, and fight on behalf of their dark master. Unfeeling creatures, revenants and whites, are pitiless and implacable. Uh, thus make, their f- make effective soldiers in the war for Mordor. Urukai, Mordor's legions. Do you know how the orcs first came into being? They were elves once, taken by the dark powers, tortured and mutilated. A ruined and terrible form of life, now perfected. My f- fighting Urukai, whom do you serve? At his best... An orc is a hardy, cunning warrior, capable of enduring immense pain and, privata- and privation. 
At his work. At his worst, in Uruk, is tuggish, disloyal, and capable of shocking cruelty. The Rakhire, much like Mordor itself, dark hearted, dangerous, and keen to spread pa pain and war. They tend to be pragmatic when it comes to industry and warfare. Uruk forges are marvels of brutal efficiency, and their armies wreak havoc on a scale Middle Earth hasn't seen for ages. They are also ruled by the fear of their master, uh, what dark, whether dark or bright. Absent that fear, Uruks are no less dangerous, but perhaps. Redeemable under the Bright Lord's guidance. The Urukai are orcs spread for war, and thus they have a heritage that stretches back to the First Age, when Morgoth twisted elves from the east into the, what Middle Earth, uh, Middle Earth knows as orcs today. Kill Brimbor used them as the backbone of his army when he sold to Mordor in the Second Age, and Sauron and later Saruman altered the orcs further. As a result, the Urukai do not breed as men do. Instead, they arise fully grown in sorcerous vats, ready to march to war from the moment they spawn. Orc, hi. These orcs are the biggest brutes in Mordor. They told me so much about brutality. Lessons of I'm keen to pass along, Garl one eye. The Urukai are trolls twisted by Sauron's magic to resist the sunlight that would turn an ordinary troll to stone. Still somewhat rare in Mordor, they generally only use the black speak though they understand the tongues of other orcs. The Urukai tend to fear them for their immense size and their close connection to the Dark Lord, who has bred them for war against the West. At Sauron's most recent creation, the Urukai tend to treat the Dark Lord with an almost religious reverence. Despite their tactile nature, they can be clever indeed and mu know much of, the, of Mordor's inner workings. Black Speech Yam Burr's new Zada Bushtan Karakin Kerrigan? Ranger. Again, that's wrong, but I'm saying the best I can. Saruman Saren, himself invented wax speech as the language of all of servants of Mordor, though only Sauron himself, the Nazgul and the Orkai speak it in its pure form. The lesser orcs can stumble through bits of wax speech in its debased form, and and all know a few words, mostly garrises and imprecations hissed at them by their betters. Uh, the language of wax speech is vast, but most of Mordor's orcs get by but with the following handful of place names, battle cries, and epithets. Burbs, maggot, worm, or other instinct. Uh, there is Gurum, a literal iron height of fortress in Carrot Ongol. Dung, a mild insult, someone lacking skill or incompetence. Gash Gor, a uh, fireheart, a fortress in Gort, Go Gorgorot. Golomor, literally elf friend, and extreme insult. Elves and orcs share an ancestry, ancestry, but orcs find that heritage repulsive. Gorgolri, battle cry, taste your death. Gorb, swine, and more broadly anything especially dirty. Gokhag, curse you, a prof uh, profanity interjector. Interjection, a profane interjection. Hum, Garig, battle cry, now you die. Care. Karagukor, Ice Fist, a, a fortress in Saragost. Ogburs, Baradur, the Dark Tower where Sauron dwells. Mub, uh, Moob, an insult to the intellect akin to fool. Uh, Orgmeg, uh, literally Orc Eater. It's an insult not because of cannibalism per se, but because it implies that the insulted party couldn't obtain more delectable flesh, such as that of man. Pashik. A uh, vermin or similar creeping annoyances. Shadnag, battle cry, you are nothing. Sharkburs, literal, literally dark hole, a fortress in Nurn. Shrak, dung, or other sorts of excrement or refuse. Shanga, Shin, Shinaga, slave, can be orc or human. Tark, a human of Nemorian origin, real or assumed. Oh, well, that explains it. I've been, I have been wondering that. Orc grunts. Battle rolls. You get to witness the might of the orcs. Real warriors. Zumog the Axe. No two orcs are alike, but the rank and file troops in Mordor armies share some characteristics. Grunts are orcs who receive a modicum of battle training after emerging from vats and are sent to the battle with basic arms and armor. They make up the bulk of Mordor's armies. Hunters practice endlessly with their spears in melee and at range and are capable of bringing down beasts and men alike. Savages wield two, hand, um, wield two axes and are used as shock troops, flinging themselves headlong into battle. 
Defenders tend to be larger, stronger orcs, a necessity given their heavy shields and long pole arms. Archers train with crossbows and are often employed as guards on orc watchtowers. Uh, so much. Assassin. Blades in the dark. Uh, you're just so strong, and it's just so tough, and none of it will matter because you're just so slow. The orcs supply the assassin's trade to decapitate their enemy's leadership, often literally. Masters of subterfuge and stealth, assassins favor ambush tactics that leave an enemy war chief or overlord dead before his retro and even knows what happened. Assassin orcs rarely last long unless they master the art of escape as well, fading into shadows or fleeing faster than their pursuers. Their ability to hide is so peerless that it can be difficult to spot, even in the Wraith world. Beastmaster. What I leave, for y leave of you will feed my pets, what they leave will feed the wild beasts, and then nothing will be left at all. Beastmasters, harness Mordor's deadliest beasts, Karagors and Graugs for Sauron's war effort. Success is not guaranteed, however. Dream beasts are rare in Mordor's armies, because so few of them survive the training at the hands of Beastmasters. But when a Beastmaster has a trained beast at his disposal, he can safely leave it off the leash, lurking nearby. The Beastmaster might seem to be alone, but he can call upon a lethal menagerie to defend them at a moment's notice. In keeping with the, be with the orc's cruel nature, the Beastmasters are as deft at killing beasts such as ghouls and drakes as they are taming more pliable beasts. Berserker, uh, also called Savages. Hit me, strike me, feed my rage, and I'll tear you asunder. Berserker orcs lash out in anger at the world around them, using that rage to fuel an array of heedless charges, mighty throws, and sweeping attacks that leave only ruined enemies behind. These orcs are beyond reason in battle, possessed by a fury that other orcs have come to fear. These orcs are the most dangerous when they're clinging to life by just a tread. The, the same rage that powers their attacks can heal their wounds when those desperate blows land. Uh, commander, leading the horde. You're not in command of anything here. Not this army, not my boys, not even your de your own destiny. I own all three. Rarely encountered alone, commanders make the orcs around them fight harder through their mere presence. The director grunts under their command to coordinate their efforts, making simultaneous attacks and surrounding enemies. Some commanders keep nearby reinforcements in reserve in case of surprise attack, and a few use themselves to draw out enemies before calling in a gang of orcs to turn the tide of battle. They are also the most ambitious orcs, eager to center the ranks and resentful when someone hinders their progress. High-ranking commanders get promoted when their boss dies in battle or has a lethal accident. Destroyer. Swords are the past and black powder is the future. A future with no place for you. Here, I'm going to stop for one sec. Oh, sweet mercy. So much to read here. Ah. <sighs> I'm just going to release this pretty much as a, an episode on its own. Because I think the vast majority of it's just been this. And I think I am going to have to leave finishing the game till tomorrow. Maybe even finishing these till tomorrow. It's 27 now, and... Uh, Mom might be up to 8, but she might be up anytime soon. Uh, it's just like, when you know, she's getting up, you know, the dogs get all excited. It's just better for me to stop recording there, because... Um, you know, there's just a bit of noise and whatnot, and I just feel bad having a bit of background noise. It certainly throws me off. Sorry about the fan, I'm just starting to cook here. There's a bit of a heat wave, and I don't do well with the heat, even for what little heat wave if it is. Mordor's armies, and indeed orcs themselves, are made of made for one thing. Destruction. The orcs who take on the mantle of destroyer use fire and explosives to wreak havoc among their enemies. Fond of explosive traps and drone bombs, destroyers don't always take the heed of other orcs who might be caught uh, who might be caught in the blast. Destroyers are usually inured to fire themselves. Yet they have nothing more than to watch their enemies burn, so they're not in the Middle Earth itself. Marksman. Ugly outfit, pink skin. Let me brighten it up with some feathers. Orcs are suited to melee combat by both training and personality, but some orcs train with crossbows and javelins to give Mordor's armies a ranged com complement. These marksmen are snipers and sentinels, careful to stay at a distant distance that's safe for them, but lethal to their enemies, especially when they augment their projectiles with ex poison or explosives. Other orcs can be dismissive of marksmen, questioning their bravery and effectiveness, but as orcs change their tune when a timely arrow saves their lives, or do they fall silent when they get a javelin to the back of the head? Slayer 
I know your ta I know your tricks, Red Walker, and they don't scare me. But how about I show you a few of my scary tricks, eh? Sailors live for hand-to-hand -hand battles and the clash of blades. They take pride in the finer points of melee technique and are capable of blindingly fast counters and strokes that leave an enemy defenseless. When the killing blow comes, it's often too fast for the enemy to see, let alone stop. These orcs often disdain mass troop tactics and archery beneath them. For the Slayer, the only real fight is one where their strength and skill overcome an en overcomes an enemy one on one. Tank, come here, pinkskin. Touch the armor you can't break. Feel the blade that flays your skin. Bred, bred and trained to withstand punishment, some orcs wear the heaviest armor from Mordor smithies. Wounds that would fell an ordinary orc don't slow them down. They are battle hardened and less likely to flee, to flee combat, but also less likely to fly into a rage when confronted with something they dislike. Trickster, Mordor's eyes and ears. Hunting you isn't much of a challenge. Let's see if you're if slaying you is a better sport. The scouts and skirmishers in Mordor's armies, trackers are, are capable of moving overland at great speed and directing the columns of troops behind them uh, where to strike. Uh, where they excel, however, is after the battle's over. Once an orc army routes its foes, the trackers spread out and chase down the fleeing enemies, ensuring that none survive. The trackers are almost preternaturally aware of their surroundings and are difficult surprise. Some carry harpoons to reel in their prey, and where you find a tracker, other orcs are rarely far behind. Go on, Ranger, try and get me. I've already taught, uh, taught out ten moves ahead, and in all of them you'll lose. Um, Tricks or orcs pride themselves on their cleverness, employing all manner of ruses and escape techniques to confound their enemies and live to fight another day. Some of their tricks require agility as they fault and dodge to stay out of harm's way. Others put orc invention and cunning to use, with an array of smoke bombs and traps for the unwary. Cam camouflage and misdirection are also key tricks, and trickster orcs can be hard to spot, even in the raped world. Dark Tribe You need not fear the Dark Brothers, but what you fear w is what lies within it, waiting for you. Good, I am actually recording, though I need to stop again for a second. Okay, folks, and I'm back. 30, 31, 32, 33, 34. The Dark Tribe favors stealth and subterfuge as their preferred means of dominating Mordor on behalf of the Dark Lord and their fanatical reverence for. Adept at ambushes, double crosses, and battlefield trickery, they wield power beyond what their numbers would suggest. Other tribes prefer not to deal with the Dark Tribe if they can help it, but because they believe is if they can help it, because they believe betrayal is inevitable. But when a troublesome warlord can be removed through other means, a word to the Dark Tribe can often suffice to get the job done. Feral tribe. Sauron will be pleased to see the beasts of Mordor feed upon your despi despicable corpse. Mordor has its denizens more fearsome than any orc, and the feral tribe takes those beasts as an inspiration for their acts of savagery. They live among beasts such as caragors and graugs when they can, and they adorn their clothing and armor with fetishes and trophies from the beasts they've hunted. The feral tribe's reverence for Mordor's beasts extends beyond clothing, though. In battle, they roar, snarl, and rend flesh with frosty rivals any Karagor. Sheen tribe. Our forgers make the dark army, dark lords, spears, and axes and arrowheads. And with and um, and with these mighty weapons of war, we will lay waste to all his enemies. Kugaluga of the Machine Tribe. The Machine Tribe believes that Mordor is on the cusp of a new age, one of industry and mechanization. Fueled by the minds of Taman Angwin, their smithies and forges turn, uh, turn out much of the Dark Lord's war material, and black plumes in the sky are a sign that the Machine Tribe's factories are near. The The Machine Tribe takes a mechanical approach to warfare as well, the soldiers moving in lockstep. Every member of the tribe sees himself as just a cog in a larger apparatus, one that someday will encompass all of Mordor. Marauder. We welcome you to this fortress. Your bodies will litter its approach. Your valuables will fill its halls. And we will toast to the Dark Lord's terrible power with grog sweetened by your blood. For the Marauder Tribe, battles are just a prequel to real action, plunder, and feasting. 
This tribe utterly sacks whatever they conquer, leaving only splinters and bones behind. Other orc tribes gripe that the marauders are more greedy than they are fearsome, even as they envy the riches the marauders have earned by the plundering others. I've been reading the signs, I've been interpreting the omens. Now I, now, uh, but now I put all that aside so I can spill the blood, sever the limbs, and rend the flesh. Mordor is a place of dark magic, and the domestic tribe knows rituals and incantations that date back thousands of years, rites of blood and death that grant power and pain in equal measure. While the domestic tribe's warriors are as capable as, as orcs of other tribes, all of Mordor fears the curses and spells that the mystic tribe, that the mystic tribe can invoke. Battling against the Mystic Tribe is a matter of overwhelming them before they can call upon their, their dark magic, uh, their black mag before they can call upon their black magic of the Dark Lord, and rumored connection to nameless evils far more ancient for aid. Warmonger Tribe, in the name of the Dark Lord, we master war. We seek, we seek it. We relish it. We will honor Sauron's name with every riven shield and severed head. Even, even among the orcs. Even among the orcs of Mordor, even among the orcs of Mordor, the warmonger tribe takes reverence for warfare to new levels. For a warmonger orc, every moment not spent in war, in battle, is a moment wasted. Twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. Yeah, I'm recording. While marching to war and guarding fortresses are tasks they take on only with reluctance, and are better left to other orcs. The greatest war chiefs among them are those who have carved the bloody swat across Mordor, slaying everything in their path. Other tribes see warmongers as brutally straightforward, but they are no less feared for it. Terror Tribe We are the ones who break the enemies of Sauron. We are the ones who make them shriek and wail and beg. We are the ones who teach you that until this day, you did not know pain. The Terror Tribe is, is obsessed with pain, inflicting it and sometimes even receiving it. Master torturers, the tribe invokes, fe invokes fear among the other orc tribes, who know that capture by the terror tribe is truly a fate worse than death. Every orc in Mordor is capable of reveling in another's pain, but the terror tribe elevate that pain into body art, m uh, measured in screams and moans. Outlaw tribe. Too long have the warmongering kingdoms of men threatened orc, uh, orc folk. To them we are mindless hordes, low vermin, and they thirst for our blood, our lands. But a reckoning is coming, brothers, for we rise. The outlaw tribe is home to the most rebellious members of our population. They have deep contempt for those who would rule all those who rule them. Uh, be they foreign invaders or towards mortal, whether dark or bright. They are intensely proud and consider themselves as members of the ultimate race. Um, the Outlaw tribe envisions Mordor as a sovereign land belonging only to orcs, though their aspirations extend far beyond Mordor and they hunger for a day when they can uh, take their war to greater Middle-earth. Other orcs see them as a rebellious, scrappy, and dangerous tribe who is just as likely to attack and uh, invading armies as they are to turn on Sauron and claim Mordor for themselves. They adorn their forts with their insignia, the Bloody Fist, and they take every opportunity to expose their message of defiance against uh, foreign races and the lesser orcs. Order tribe. There's orcs who say you can't, you shouldn't play with your food, but sometimes that's the whole point. The Sorter tribe are the most bloodthirsty of the orcs. Their bloodlust goes beyond that, any interest in war, conquest, or even torture. They're obsessed with viscera, but with blood and guts, with the splatter of warm gore under their ecstatic faces. For kill, uh, for slaughter orcs, killing is messy and usually uh, precedes any further acts of savage, uh, savagery and cannibalism. Uh, they show an almost complete disregard for their appearance, often wearing ragged aprons or uncured animal skins, still dripping with blood. Sword orcs usually take small trophies from their enemies, such as fingers, hands, and feet, assuming said uh, items haven't been eaten. Likewise, their forts are draped with the skins of their victims to remind them of the thrill of battle and the pleasure of the feast that follows. They revel in their reputation for being bloodthirsty, but the bloodthirstiness of the sword tribe can turn the stomach of even the toughest orc. Um, I'm going cross-eyed. Yeah, I'm seriously going cross-eyed right now. Ugh. The things I do for you... 
You better goddamn respect this. <laughs> Kill me. Uh, spinning a uh, spider. Spinning webs across Mordor. See the webs? It's spiders. Footy creatures. Likely coming up from the valley down south. Most orcs regard individual spiders as bad luck and a swarm of them as an ill omen. They dismiss the spiders of Mordor as mere pets, not realizing that each uh, crawling arachnid might be the eyes and ears of sh Shelob. Unlike rats, spiders are mere nuisances. They don't steal enough food to notice, and only a few have bites that are, uh, uh, that are all dangerous. But with their ability to climb and scurry, there's almost no place in Mordor they can't reach, and eradicating them is a fool's errand. Hellhawk. Aerial spies. I swear that Hellhawk was following me. Those things are smarter than they let on. Though orc and man alike call them hellhawks, these avian predators have little in common with the feathered uh, birds of other lands. These reptiles soar on leathery wings, then dive to feast on rats, spiders, and other fine, cre tre fine creatures such as crows. Their long necks let them deliver a fatal bite, while their bodies remain out of their pr struggling prey's reach. The orcs of Mordor believe that hellhawks are the favorites of the Dark Lord, his eyes and sky throughout his domain. The men of Gondor are less certain of this, but most will, shoot, will, most will lose an arrow at a hellhawk if it flies too close, just in case. Last night I heard rats whispering to each other, I think they're plotting something. Men and orcs agree on only one thing. Rats are Mordor's greatest pest. The feral rats of the Dark Land breed quickly, devour food stocks, chew through all manner of ropes, strap, and tent cloth. Some carry diseases and all can deliver a painful bite when threatened or hungry. When they are ravenous, rats are patient enough to wait for the vulnerable moments when a larger creature is distracted, and the rations are momentarily unwatched. The campfire tales among the Orakai describe swarms of rats bold enough to, tank it, uh, to attack an orc in broad daylight, consuming him down to the bones in a matter of minutes. No orc has seen it first hand, but, of all of hers, but they've all seen enough rats to find the tale plausible. None doubt rats would try it if they thought it would work. Sorry, I hit off the mic. Mogai flies. I thought Mogai flies would have sucked you dry. I should have stayed to make sure. Swarming insects that feed on unburied corpses that Mordor has in abundance. Mogai flies spend much of the time dormant in hanging nests. But when a nest is disturbed, the flies swarm about and sting any orcs in the vicinity. The buzzing of an angry cloud of Mogai flies is enough to make many orcs flee in terror. Orcs dislike, this, orcs dislike of Mogai flies is rooted in more than just fear of their painful stings. The fly has a red marking on its back that orcs associate with the Eye of Sauron himself. Uh, ghouls hate the light, so douse it and see what comes a calling. Nocturnal pack scavengers. Ghouls are among Mordor's most dangerous pets. The uh, pests, uh, swarming out of mounds or caves at night. They're indi individually no match for orcs, but overwhelming when they surround their prey. Most ghoul attacks would attack with a tooth and claw, but some can belch a glob of this toxic acid at a distance. They flee from the light, and sometimes a torch is enough to put to keep a small pack at bay. Ghoul packs are led by a ghoul matron, generally the largest and toughest of ghouls in the group. Ghoul matron. Watch out for the matron. One, uh, once her brood starts dropping, uh, her blood will be up. While ghouls are individually weak, the ma ghoul matron that rules each nest is to be feared. She is physically stronger than a typical man or orc, but her greatest threat is the poisonous bile she, spe uh, bile she spews se se uh, several yards away. The bile is caustic and poisonous, and the ordinary ghouls know to swarm any victim hit by it. Once the ghoul matron hits her target, it's only a question of whether Vile's toxin or the other ghouls finish the victim off. And if ghoul matron herself holds in battle, another ghoul grows to take her place and lead the pack. Caragor. I saw the whites of the Caragor's eyes. I smelled its breath, felt its teeth in my neck. A Mordor's fiercest hunters, Caragors prowl in small packs, seeking everything from orcs to graugs to consume. They prefer to pounce on their enemies than chomp down with a bite from their massive jaws, worrying their prey, uh, worrying their prey like a ragdoll until dead. Uh, Caragors are also as f are also fast runners and adept climbers, capable of scaling sheer cliffs in search of prey. Almost suicidally brave, they rarely leave combat until they are their prey are dead. Some orcs capture Caragors and attempt to train them for war. But Caragors are ill-tempered enough to make the attempt dangerous for even the bravest orc. Still, occasionally orc, orc will, uh, will succeed through look, guile, or sheer, sheer determination. Dire Caragor. 
Ook Book was a bit of a joke till he captured a dark cargo and made it his mount. No one jokes about Ook Book anymore. While dark cargoes are larger than ordinary cargoes, that is what makes them more dangerous. They are Mordor's most cunning predator, capable of great feats of tracking, but too elusive for all but the most patient hunter. A dark Aragora has a power hide than other Aragors, and his pelt is considered a marked distinction among the orcs of Mordor, especially Beastmasters and anyone in the Feral Tribe. Uh, dark Aragors are solitary creatures, spurning even the other Aragors as they stalk the wilds of Mordor. Little is known of their behaviors otherwise, as observers tend to become the Car dark Aragors' next meal. Graug. First, you will feel the Graug's footfalls. Hmm. Second, you'll hear a running, a runner screaming, and third, that's where the fun starts. One of the largest species in Mordor, Graugs are, the lar are gigantic creatures with armor-plated scales and immense strength. Native to Nurn, but found in other parts of the region, Graugs are natural enemies of Caragors, great beasts or the werewolves of the eastern desolation. Uh, when hungry, they'll consume nearly any living creature, including men or orcs if they're available. The orcs of Mordor hunt Graugs on occasion, though such hunts are often lethal for the hunters. Packs of Caragors sometimes attempt to bring down Graugs as well, though their success is far from guaranteed. Graugs can kill attackers many ways, by eating them, by swatting them with their massive fists, or merely stomping on them. Rare Graug. Magic Twisted Titans. As if regular Graugs weren't bad enough, Mordor has uh, had to create something worse. Crimp the Knower. The immense strength and bulk of an ordinary orc, uh, ordinary Graug is threat enough, but Graugs, capable of spewing bitter cold, virulent poison, or scorching flame, have been sided with in Mordor. Most orcs believe that the rare Graugs are the result of magical, of uh, ritual experimentation from the mythic tribe or the manipulation of Sauron himself, and thus they're reluctant to hunt these beasts. A few beast, orc beastmasters, however, see the taming of a rare Graug as a worthy challenge. Drake. Drakes are speeding armored juggernauts of tearing claws and searing flame, and when the Nazgul finally let us orcs fly them, we'll be unstoppable. Bred in the pits of Baradur by Sauron himself as the infertile spawn of dragon and fell beast, drakes are aerial killers that rule the skies of Mordor as mountainous board, uh, um, rule the skies of Mordor's mountainous borders. Drakes swoop from above, disabling their prey with scorching flames and finishing them with a bite from their powerful jaws, for carrying it off to consume elsewhere. If their meal is still struggling after the initial attacks, drakes are cunning enough to descend then drop their prey, so foster their death. Drakes are depth scavengers and have no compunction against scra scrapping a meal off the ground if needed be. Their favorite prey are the eagles, the great eagles who have sometimes tried to enter disguise of Mordor. Uh, drakes are stubborn creatures, and nearly impossible to tame without the aid of magic, though some orcs persist in trying. Others are careful not to leave carrion out under the open sky, these attract drakes that will consume the carcasses, then seek out fresh prey nearby. The cold great eagles trying to enter Mordor by flying is a nod to people like, Why didn't they, the eagles just fly Frodo in with the ring? It's a common thing, and it's been com commented on in different Lord of the Rings games. You know the game where you can play as an elf, a dwarf, or a human? And you, like, if you're playing as a human, you can have a friend playing as an elf, and you, you're playing together. You can actually talk to Gandalf and ask that very question. Mount Doom was his forge. It was the source of his power, and will be the source of his destruction. The fiery heart of Mordor, Mount Doom is a massive volcano, also known as Amon Amart, Mount, Mountain of Fate, and Urdrun, Fiery Mountain. Amon Amart is also a... A heavy metal band, or maybe death metal? It's a metal band. Uh, they sing songs about Vikings and the like. Some people refer to it as Viking metal, but uh, the band isn't quite a, uh, isn't a fan of that name. Uh, Sauron forged the One Ring on Mount Doom, and later killed Brimbor perfected it there, then stole it. And thus, it is the only place where it can truly be destroyed. Mountain has a preternatural connection to Sauron, lying dormant when Sauron is not present in the world and flaring with eruptions when the Dark Lord is active. Within Mount Doom is Samet Nur, the chamber where Sauron fashioned the One Ring, where Kelbrimbor and Talion would come to craft the new Ring of Power. Sindarin, for Chambers of Fire, Samet Nur, is often deserted, for the orcs believe it to be a cursed place and do not approach it willingly. Uh, Minas Irith has many names, the Tower of the Moon, the Fair and Radiant, the Forgotten City, but to me it is home. 
uh, Minas Ital, the Tower of the Rising Moon in, Sindar in Sindarin, is a fortified city on the western edge of Mordor, the last refuge of man in that land. Founded by the refugees after Numenor's destruction, the city was built of white marble to catch and reflect moonlight, and it often glows in the twilight, and when the moon is high in the sky. A sapling of the white tree, Gondor's symbol, was pla uh, planted here as early as Second Age, but Isildur removed it when Sauron threatened Minas Ital during the War of the Last Alliance. Uh, after Sauron's defeat in that war, Minas Ital was restored as a Gondorian fortress. Rain so to this day, though the orcs of Mordor draw ever closer to taking the only place of Mordor beyond the reach of the Return Dark Lord. The fortress protects more than the men within its walls, however, it guards one of the plant here, seeing stones made by the elves in a bygone age. Sirit, Sirit Ungol. Uh, those caves are a doomed place, full of spiders and shadows in the great darkness at their center. The spiders cleft in the sin Sirin Sindarin language. Uh, Sirit Ungol is the pass that connects eastern Gondor and the western edge of Mordor. Its most prominent feature is the Tower of Sirit Ungol. Uh, built by Gondor to guard against Mordor's incursions, then abandoned when Gondor's power declined at the start of the Third Age. Below the pass is Torek, Torek Ungol, Shilb's lair. There, uh, there the great uh, giant spider dwells, feeding on the rest of Mordor's inhabitants and scheming amid her dark webs. Uh, Mordor is vast, and it is true. Even at the edge of Mor uh, Gondor is vast, and it is true. Even at the... Uh, even at the edge of Mordor, where darkness threatens to swallow us, Gondor will survive, even if we do not. The greatest realm of man at the ed end of the Third Age, Gondor traces its heritage to Num Numenorian explorers from the West Sea who settled it centuries ago. Founded by Isildur and his brother Anarion, Gondor w has long stood as a counterweight to Mordor. Sauron went to war with Gondor and the other nations of man shortly after the island of Numenor collapsed beneath the waves, but the last alliance of men and elves defeated him when Isildur cut the one ring from Sauron's finger. A succession of kings descended from Anarion, uh, ruled the realm onto the witch king of Angmar, lured uh, Erenor into a solitary quest, from which he never returned. Since Erenor's disappearance, Gondor has been ruled by a steward, a hereditary position that exercised the power of a king, though someone of Isildur and Arian's line appears to reclaim the throne. She retained the trapping of royalty and dismissed the likelihood that a king uh, will ever return. Gondor's fortunes have waned as of late, as Sauron has grown more powerful. Western regions have come under assault by forces from Mordor, Eastern tribes, and corsairs along the southern shores. Gondorians on the realm's frontier in places like Minas Ital fear there will be next to fall to darkness. Bard Dur. From the summit of Bard Dur, his eye watches ceaselessly, but he will not. But he's not so mighty yet that he's above fear. Doubt ever gnaws at him. Also known as Log Burrs in Black Speech, Bard Dur is Saruman's fortress home, an immense tower at the foot of Mount Doom. Uh, read in shadow, read it in shadow and smoke. It is a place where mortals do not tread willingly, and even most boastful orcs will not claim to have seen it from the inside. It is as much a prison as his fortress, and Sauron's enemies disappear into Baradur, never to return. The barrows. Barrows are full of treasure and debt, and if you're stupid enough to go digging around in them, you'll probably find a boat. The barrows are tombs of ancient dead, constructed by Kalbrimbor's army during his life to venerate the greatest champions who had fallen into battle with Sauron's forces. The few present-day orcs Mordor who know the barrows regard them as haunted and do not go willingly go there. From the inside, Mordor's barrows resemble the bar ancient the barrow mounds are the barrow downs east of the Shire, where the dimly remembered descendants of the Morians were, were buried. As with many things in Mordor, however, these barrows are both uh, more ominous and more death haunted than their Nemorian counterparts. Hmm. Oh, that was the same icon from the first game the Black Gate. One does not simply walk into Mordor. Its black gates are guarded by more than just orcs, Ormir. Uh, Morinon, the black gate of Mordor, is an immense wall built across Serat uh, Gorgor. Gorgor? Eh. 
Uh, the passage serves as Mordor's m northwest entrance. Built by Sauron himself in the Second Age, the Black Gate was in Gondor's possession when Talon was stationed as captain there. The Black Hand of Sauron attacked the gate, and so Talon's family and began the ritual that ended in Kelbrimbor and Talon being bonded together. Erid Glamtot, uh, evil host, is a place of great horror, even to the habits of Mordor who avoid his mountains. Uh, it was here that the Tower of Sauron made his home. Neuron. I have seen Sauron's servants. They bring much suffering. If you wish to know where they are, they are across the Sea of Nornin. The only part of Mordor that can claim to be fertile, Nornin lies in the south along the salty Sea of Nornin. N Norn, Nornin, man. Yeah. Uh, Sauron's slaves till the field here to feed his armies. The volcanic soil is rich, and the streams leading to the area irrigate the land enough to make large-scale farming possible. Unlike the rest of Mordor, Nurin is home to tribes of men, descendants of corsairs who came across the sea. Until recently, Lady Marwyn, Queen of the Shore, ruled Nurin. But with Sauron and his black captains, re but then Sauron and his black captains wrest control of the region from her. Lady Marwyn sought aid from Saruman, but he magically possessed her so he could learn more about Sauron's, pl Sauron's plans. While fighting the Black Captains, time broke uh, Saruman's hold on Lady Marwyn, but Nurin remains under Sauron's control. Tyne did a query what happened to them, and that never was answered. We're here to guard it, but only Nazgul can enter. Uh, it just shows you there's worse horrors in this world than orcs. Uh, Sin uh, Sindarin for Tower Black Sorcery, uh, Minas Morgul was once Minas Ital, the last Gondorian fortress of Mordor. Now that Sauron has besieged and reclaimed it, Angmar the Witch King uses Minas Morgul as a base of operations for Nazgul and the Orcs of Mordor. Uh, orcs of Mordor. From Minas Morgul, the Dark Lord's forces threaten Gondor itself and have nine unassailable defense against invasion from the west. The Witch King's power has twisted the city into, uh, into a dark mockery of the white marble wonder it once was. Once a month, this is, sorry, spent a month in Gorgoroth once. The lava don't kill you and you don't get done in by the Nazgul, you might get promoted. Then you're stuck there forever. The heart of Sauron's realm, Gorgoroth, is an arid volcanic plateau surrounded by high mountain ranges. Mineral rich, it is home to the mines and forges that fuel the Dark Lord's armies. Little can grow in such a hostile land, and the orcs who call Gorgoroth home run food from elsewhere, a network of cisterns and wells along the military highways that crisscross the region. Theron's fortress of Barad-dûr dominates the landscape in Gorgoroth, eclipsed only by the immensity of Mount Doom itself, shuddering and smoking on the horizon. Rohan, let this be the hour when we draw swords together. Foul deeds awake. For, now for Rat, now for Rune, and the Red Dawn. Theoden. The grasslands of Rohan, to Mordor's northwest, are known for the hardy farmers and herdsmen who called home. The clans of. of. Rohimmer. Rohirrim? Rohirrim? A landlocked nation, Rohan is known for its exceptional, exceptional horses and the purest cavalry that patrols their borders. Rohan uh, rose from various horse clans in the Second Age, with the Gondor in battle against the Orcs of Mordor. Ero the Younger was Rohan's first king, and he, his line lasted until Helm Hammerhand's death. The second line of kings began under Helm Ham, uh, Helm's nephew, Freelaf, and lasts to this day, aided by the council of the wizard Saruman, whose tower of Isengard lies within Rohan's borders. Serengost. We'll carry your corpse to Serengost. And put you on display. Uh, Serengost, Blood Fortress in Sindarin, uh, is an Uruk fortress in north central in north central Mordor that guards the Mitram Gap, just south of the Ash Mountains. Arid Litu, uh, Arid Litu. Uh, ash and soot from the nearby Mount Doom darkened the air, and the place is known for its inhospitable, on his inhospitable, inhospitable. Inhospitality. Inhos I can't say it. I'm. I've talked too much. Inhospitality. Inhospitable. 
I can't say. Whatever. Uh, even in Mordor. Despite its proximity to Mount Doom, it's bitterly cold, and parts remain snowbound no matter the season. Many of Mordor's orcs spe uh, speak of Saragos with fear and or reverence because they know it as the first spawning place for the Orkai, Oakai, Sauron's most dangerous breed of Oak. Torbrad. Kill me if you must, but don't send me to Torbrad. Uh, Cyrodiil for abhorrent prison, Torbrad is a key port in the slave trade along the Sea of Nornan in Mordor. It is vital to war efforts, linking the southern resources with, and supplies with, with the war effort against the nations of Man to the north. Among the, among the orcs of Mordor, Torbrand, Torbrand is a threat. Do you want to captain see that, or send you to Torbrand? Most slaves in Torbrand are men, not orcs. But even for the jailers, Torbrand is a depressive in place. Ran around that in the first game. Mm. Oh, just one second. Here, one sec. Hey, folks. Oh, I can't stop panicking. Plantier. A plantier is dangerous tool, Salmon. Why? Why should we first use it? Creations of the Valinor Elves in First Age, the Plantier enabled long-distance communication across their far-flung lands. By looking into the dark crystal of a Plantier, one can see the surroundings of the other Plantier and mentally converse with anyone looking into another Plantier. Someone of great power can dominate or compel a lesser mind through the orb. Many of the Plantier were lost in the Second Age, but a few persist. Good one the Witch King sees in Mi uh, Minas Ithil, uh, when Minas Ithil fell, and another in Saruman's hands at Isengard. Asgar. But my arrows fly true, and their targets cease to be. Kelbrimbor's bow was a gift from Navari, uh, a dwarven uh, maker who was Kelbrimbor's collaborator in life. Uh, the two created many wonders in Middle Earth together, including the doors of Doran that led to the dwarven realm of Moria. The arms of the bow have an inscription on them in Kuzdul, the language of dwarves. Nari had made, him, had made me for the ringsmith and for his loyal service. It may his arrows, his arrows may they truly hit their mark. Ak, a turn. A turn? It reminds me of a simpler time and of why I fight. The dagger a turn was once a sword belonging to Dirao, Italian son. Broken when the orcs seized the Black Gate and killed the Italian's family, the sword, was, uh, the sword has an intact hilt and several inches of undamaged blade, making it a serviceable and sound weapon. As a Gondorian custom, uh, Talon gave the makeshift blade a name in Cyrodiil. Acre means vengeance. Later inscribed it with the following in Cyrodiil. Sy a, dag a dagger secret... A dagger secret in the night, terrifying evildoers who must gi give back what blood swallows pain and red becomes black. Urfail. Upon this sword I swear, never shall I rest while Sauron stirs in the shadows. Urfail, synodrin for fiery, gleaming brilliance, was Talion's sword in life, serving as his primary weapon when his ranger of Gondor. He retrieved it when the Black Hand of Mordor banished him from death and has wielded it ever since. Retalion, the sword is an extension of the self and distillation of all his ranger training. When Talion swore vengeance for his family death, he did so on this sword, keeping with Gondorian tradition. Alegos. Against my glaive, none can stand. Kel Brimbor's glaive once belonged to the elf king Gil Galad, who wielded against Sauron's forces in the, last, uh, in the War of the Last Alliance in Second Age. Though Gil-galad Gil fell to Sauron in that battle, his glaive survived to be wooed by Sauron's wraith, uh, Calbrimbor's wraith. The name Agos means icicle in Sinodrin. The blade bears an inscription. Gil-galad Gil wields a well-made spear. The orc will feel my point, uh, point of ice. When he sees me in fear of death, he will know my name, Elegos. Durin. So find a gift. Kelbrimbor's hammer. Duran. Dur uh, Duran? Yeah. Uh, Duran. Uh, was. Tu uh, Turan? Turan? Is there something I should know? 
Um, was originally not a weapon for war, but a craftsman tool. Sauron gave Cole Brimboard a hammer when he taught the elves ju uh, jewel smithing techniques will culminate in the forging of the Ring's power, and the hammer's name is Sinodrin for Gift of Power. The hammer's history belies its origin as a present, however. Sauron used the uh, hammer to kill Cal Brimbor's family as he watched, then Sauron brought Turin down a Cal Brimbor himself. In time, Cal Brimbor would see his own rate them as a dark sort of gift, as allowed him to pursue his vengeance against Sauron and, with the power of the rings, bring the gift of order to all of Middle Earth. Hi dear. With each tower we reclaim, the Witch King's vision diminishes. Rough tr uh, imitations of Plantir, Hadir, are Sauron's means of overseeing Mordor. Like a volunteer, they enable long distance communication, ob observation, and communication, though they lack the range of power of a volunteer. Like a volunteer, each Hadir is fashioned of a dark, of dark crystal and invested with Dark Lord's power. While a Hadir is incapable of the subtle mind manipulations that the power of a volunteer can accomplish, the stone is sufficient to transmit strong emotions, such as hate or fear, and a master can project his will through a Hadir to dominate weak minded orcs. Mirian. It seems uncommonly light, yet hard as flint to the touch. Coins made of dwarven mitral. Mirian was the common courtesy used by the elves long ago in Middle Earth. When he first rose to power, Sauron ordered Mirian confiscated or destroyed, so Mordor is one of the few places where Mirian still exists. Uh, even there, it, uh, it is a curiosity to the orcs who find it, a rare artifact for the few who know its ancient history. Why would Mordor be one of the few places where you could find it if that was his stronghold? I would confiscate it or destroy it, so they would have brought it back. Alright. In the previous game, they just said destroyed. So, to explain why it's so rare and it's, a, you know, a, a collectible. In, in this only one case as a, like a, a historical artifact. Uh, the Nine Rings of Power. Gifts with a terrible price. Nine for mortal men doomed to die. The Order of the Rings epigraph. Kobrimbor forged the Nine Rings in conjunction with a disguised Sauron, a part of a set of gifts for the men. For men, dwarves who received seven similar rings, and elves who received three rings crafted by Kobrimbor without Sauron's knowledge. Unbeknownst to Kobrimbor, Sauron fashioned an additional ring, the fabled One Ring, with the power to dominate and command the wearers of the other rings. Kel Brimbor and the elves soon learned of Sauron's plot, but Sauron killed Kel Brimbor and recovered the nine rings for men and the seven for dwarves. He gave the rings to the most powerful kings, sorcerers, and warriors among the men of the Second Age, and in time also comes to Sauron's influence, and eventually became the ring rates, uh, ring rates in his thrall. R uh, the rings of power grant their wearer freedom from aging and death, and they can disappear from the world, invisible to all who do not wear a ring matching the Bright Lord's power. Their other specific abilities depend on the wearer's willpower and ability to tap into its power while resisting Sauron's lure. The time has come for a new ring. Seeking a means to, con uh, to counter Sauron's uh, influence in Mordor, Talion and Kel Brimbor fashioned a new ring of power in Samanur, the same place Sauron forged the One Ring. Because Sauron does not currently possess the One Ring, they believe the, uh, the new ring is free of his influence. Because Kyle Brimbor was the greatest jewel smith of his age and remembers the techniques Sauron taught him, the, one ring, the new ring is every bit as powerful as the nine rings of power, and every bit as dangerous. Inscribed upon the new ring are these words. I renounce the blessed realm, to redeem the land of shadow, and bind the walls of Arda. In the place of the dark lord, you shall have light undiminished. All shall fear me and rejoice. That last line is very much in line with what Gadriel said. You know, uh, you know if she got corrupted by it. All shall love me and despair. Every gem glitters, but only the finest truly shine. Mined by dwarves and fashioned into jewelry by elves, gems are merely decorative, although they're set into objects of power, at which point their magic infuses the object to wondrous result. It takes a master jewelsmith such as Kyle Brimbor to set a gem and unlock its potency. To work some Mordor, gems are shiny trinkets, nothing more. W uh, the One Ring, Middle Earth's greatest prize. One, uh, well, that's one thing I don't want to find in my cereal box. One Ring to rule them all. One Ring to find them. One Ring to bring them all, and in the darkness bind them. 
The One Ring, Sauron's greatest creation and the key to ruling Middle-earth, has passed through several hands since Isildur cut it off Sauron's hand. Isildur rarely wore the One Ring, though he kept it close and believed himself to be the Lord of the Rings. When Isildur fell in battle with the orcs, he lost the One Ring in the river Anduin. Uh, the One Ring travelled downstream until the creature now known as Gollum found it, guarded it jealously, even as it twisted his body and mind. The now hobbit, Bilbo Baggins, uh, took the ring after Gollum dropped it and kept it for himself. First tricking Gollum and later donning the ring to escape. A present one ring is with Bilbo in the Shire. Bilbo has no idea of the ring's history or great power and treats it as the favorite heirloom of his adventures. The great forces of Middle Earth, including Sauron, Saruman, Gandalf, and Gladriel, believe the one ring may be lost forever, though Sauron and, S Sauron and Saruman continue to search for it. And that's been everything I've unlocked thus far, and with that, I'm bringing my playthrough. Uh, the set for today to a close. It's 20 past 7. I could probably finish it, but... Okay, you know what? Fuck it. Let's, let's see. What's left? Just this, this, it seems. No, you know what? Let's leave this till tomorrow. Let's leave that till tomorrow. I'm getting... I'm fucking wrecked right now. Let's leave that till tomorrow. I sincerely hope you've enjoyed. I sincerely hope you join me again soon. Till then, love and peace, baby.